love loss a journey and terrorism <laughs> these words seem to perfectly sum up my experience of playing the original final fantasy 7 for context i played the remake during quarantine mainly in 2021 that was an experience that i never forgot which is why just in time for final fantasy rebirth i got this towards the end of 2023 I wanted to see why this game, out of all of them, was so beloved, and despite being released in 1997 on the PlayStation 1, it gets talked about all the time. What I loved about this version, compared to the remake, which it had an advantage over, is the fact that it's a complete game. For those of y'all that don't understand, Final Fantasy VII is split into three parts. Part 1 is set in Midgar, Part 2 is an exploration of all the characters and worlds, and Part 3 is the end of the world stuff. While we're at it, let's start off with Midgar. It took me a minute to get used to the graphics of the game during this time period, but once I did, it didn't even faze me. Midgar is fairly the same as in the remake, however there was one key difference that I noticed here. It's that Sephiroth wasn't as prevalent here. In the remake, he's in a bunch of cutscenes and in a decent amount of the game, but here he's more like an enigma, myth, and a legend. Midgar served as a great introduction to our characters, Cloud, Tifa, Barret, and the other members of the terrorist group Avalanche. Okay, maybe Vigilantes. These other members are Wedge, Biggs, and Jesse. You spend about 10 hours in Midgar, and partway through it, you start to build camaraderie with some of the other members and get to admire the city with no sunlight. Midgar. After Sector 7 of Midgar blows up completely, in an attempt to lay waste to the remaining members of Avalanche, they move towards a nearby city. This city is calm. It's in here we get to find out about Cloud's backstory and where he's from, Nibelheim. Nibelheim is his hometown and Tifa's as well. I love this as well because it's a playable backstory and we get to build upon our characters, which is a major selling point of this game to me. Here we actually get to see Sephiroth, his encounter with everyone, and what his mannerisms are like. This made it feel more rewarding than the remake, which hand fed you him right in part 1. You also get to see how powerless Cloud is in comparison to Sephiroth, which will be a theme further continued into the story. Eventually at some point, Sephiroth finds out the truth about himself that he was experiment mixed with the nightmarish creature, Genova. Having the sudden and drastic realization, Sephiroth loses his mind and goes mad. Okay, that's pretty normal. Then he does what any sane person would do if they were in the exact same predicament, burn the entire town of Nibelheim down. Boy, ain't no fucking way, boy. You've gotta be kidding me. I know we don't know Sephiroth all that well, but we spent the last couple of moments with him fighting alongside with him, growing stronger, and making memories just for Cloud's hometown to be burned to the ground. Keep in mind, Cloud idolized him up until this point and wanted to be like him growing up within Soldier. Imagine spit in the face this must have been a Cloud at this very moment in time. Thankfully he's realistic and decides to set the rest of his life to offing Sephiroth. Moving on, we head to Junon. It's a major city and a military installation. Even for a game released back in 1997, I love how it showcased how big the city was and the detail in it. I also enjoyed them throwing in the twist of the minigames, like us giving CPR and taking part in the marching parade. It feels like the game is making this more of an experience for you, as opposed to, let's hurry up and defeat the bad guy now. Next up, we got one of my favorite places in the game, North Corral. This is Barrett's hometown, and I think it has one of the best backstories and world design. This city is shown to be a deserted wasteland that somehow still seems to be holding up. I love the brown and grayish colors, the rubbish, and how it all comes together cohesively. In this section, and in the Golden Saucer, we found some guys to be taken out with what appears to be gun marks. This came at a time right after Barrett left our party in a fit of rage. At first we had our doubts, but it does leave room for the creeping suspicion of the question, did he do it? Luckily we found out that the guy who did it had a gun on his hand too, but his was on the left hand side. Upon approaching this guy, we find out about Barrett's backstory and learn that this was all at the hand of his friend, Dine. This all leads to us finding out about how Corel came to be what it is today. We find out that Shinra was to blame after an attack on the Corel reactor. They blamed the people of Corel and burned the city down to the ground. Seriously, what is with these people burning cities down to the ground? Nobody was safe, whether you're a man, woman, or a child. At this point in time, Barrett and Dine were out on a mission together. Dine ends up falling off a cliff and is presumed to be dead until the current day. I love how the game ends up telling the story even through the combat. You can see Dine in the fight struggling to come to terms with reality and is somewhat trying to cling on to his sanity. You can see he is remorseful at the end of the fight, but he has lost all hope and sees his psychotic rampage as the only way to go on. This is until Barrett lets him know that they're not the only survivors of the incident of Corel. He lets Dine know that his daughter Marlene is still alive. Up until this point in time, we believe that Marlene is Barrett's daughter, which made this shocking 
and amazing. You can start to see Dain sobering up upon hearing this, and he ceases his fight, but upon realizing all the damage that he's done, he decides to leave Marlene in his friend's hand as he says one last goodbye to Barrett, the same way we initially thought that he went out. Damn! Now ain't that something. I loved all this because of the emotional weight, but it started to explain a lot more about Barrett, and it made his personality and his actions make a lot more sense. At first, you think he's a fast-talking hothead, but during this arc, you realize that he almost had everything taken away from him. But unlike Dine, he didn't use that as a reason to do the same to other people, but instead find purpose in his life and help the people of Midgar be free from Shinra. If that's not beautiful writing, then I don't know what is. Quick little side note, I know this game was a product of its time, but some voice acting with these scenes would have made it a treat to watch. Although with the recent State of Play trailer for the Rebirth game that's out, I already know that it's about to slap. You can also tell that this game is a product of its time with the amount of times that it drops the word retard. When I first saw it, I was taken aback by it, but the more I saw it, the more I got numb to it. I do admit that it'll never not be funny ever seeing that word in a piece of dialogue within the game. Also, can we all agree that the music from this game is amazing, especially with the victory song? I used to hear it as a meme used in videos, but actually hearing it in gameplay spikes my dopamine to new heights, and I'm here for it. It's so good that I'm listening to the soundtrack on YouTube while writing the script. One of the best moments in the game in building atmosphere happens in the Shinra HQ. It's at one of the higher floors that the gang are held prisoners in the same rooms. Some time passes, and then the music starts to change. For some odd reason, the guards who were once there are gone and you can see large streaks of red all across the floor. The eerie music sent shivers up my spine when I was experiencing this. Then seeing all the dead bodies on the floor as you're following the trail adds even more to the suspense as you eventually find the beast who's responsible for all this carnage. People may bag on this game for its looks, myself included, but you cannot take away the amazing world building and atmosphere that it brings. And this is how it felt for me in 2024. I couldn't have imagined how this felt for people experiencing this for the first time back in 1997. The three times speed option and turning off the enemy encounters made this game so much easier to handle. Because as much as I love this game, it runs at a snail's pace more often than not, which doesn't help when I'm trying to make more YouTube videos like this one. I also had to get used to the save point function. Man, did I ever take the save function for granted. For those of you that don't know, you have to find save points on the map or be outside of a city in the open world to save your game. Otherwise, you were screwed. <laughs> I also had to get used to Reno and Rude's introductions being changed in the remake. When you see them separately, you get to fight them as well. However, in the OG version, you can only fight them in a group setting. I know I've talked about the graphics quite a bit. The cutscenes, in my opinion, still hold up to this day. Each of them were amazing and added to the overall experience and enjoyment of the game. Put some respect on these scenes, man. I also forgot to say this, but that one jump on the swinging rope climbing to the Shinra HQ sucked monkey balls. It felt like complete luck and took way more time than it needed to. Some characters in this game are optional like Yuffie and Vincent for instance. I didn't even bother with Vincent since there was a whole ass boss and code that I had to unlock. I got Yuffie, damn was she a pain in the ass. First you find her in some woods, then you fight her and win. After this you have to answer in a set way to get her and if you mess up at any part of it then she escapes and jacks you of your stuff. Isn't that lovely? At this point I will question if I was playing a dating sim, a visual novel or a bloody JRPG. Later in the game, we also find out that we have a rat in our party. This is none other than Kate Sith. You obtain him in the Golden Saucer, and man, when I found out that he was a traitor, all hell broke loose. I promise you that I was screaming at my TV screen for a solid 5 minutes, calling him a traitor. I already liked the game at this point, and was emotionally invested by Corel, but here is when I knew that I loved the game. Also, we get used to Cloud tweaking like he did in the Temple of the Ancients. He was losing his mind and started to become Sephiroth's little bitch boy. <laughs> Also, why the hell was that red dragon fight in the temple so damn hard? This was the point where I knew I had to grind if I was going to overcome this obstacle. After 10 to 20 levels worth of grinding, it made the difference and it allowed me to progress. Bahamut was definitely my saving grace in this fight and the wall monster right after it. While part of me was still spiteful at this point, I will admit that Kate Sith paid his dues with his sacrifice for us to be able to gain the black material. Shortly after all seems well, Sephiroth pulls a Jedi mind trick on Cloud and obtains the black material from him. You had one job, Cloud! I also knew that the spoiler of Aerith dying was gonna happen, but I can't see why this impacted so many fans till this day. I love the whole build up with that and the staircase to the Forgotten City, which was amazing. When I first saw this scene, I thought to myself, how the hell did Cloud not see Sephiroth descend from the heavens? And why did Aerith just sit there? Although upon rewatching the scene a few times, it made sense to me. 
It's like Aerith knew this was going to happen and that it was going to be a necessary part in the next chain of events. This makes all the scenes with her and Cloud early in the game make sense, with her the Golden Sorcerer, the Don's Palace, and Sector 6. Her send-off was done amazingly well. Whoever did that part deserves an award. No, better yet, a trophy. I love the colours and the somber tone of it, saying goodbye to this party member who at first was an obligation but became more of a true friend, especially to Cloud. Aerith brought life to the crew and to the game and made the cutscenes a joy to watch. She was also the best healer and MP user in the crew. So when she's no longer a part of your party, you can feel that the game gets dimmer and loses some life in it. I also loved how they didn't bring her back or psych us out. This reflected the true nature of death very well. It also showed us that although she might be dead, that doesn't mean that she had to be forgotten. This reminds me of that one scene in One Piece with Chopper and the goodbye of his mentor. His mentor says that people don't die when they are gone physically, but die when the people around them forget about them entirely. That's always a concept that stuck with me ever since I first saw it. Back to Final Fantasy VII. We also find out that Professor Gast was the husband of Ilfana, Eris' mother, and I don't blame him because I would have done the same. Have you seen her? Ooh, I can't wait to see a remastered version of her. We also find out that partway through the game, Cloud has amnesia. It's here that we find out that he was a failed Sephiroth clone, pumped with Geneva cells, and was never a first class soldier. This explains why Cloud was tweaking every time Sephiroth was near him, since he is a part of him. We also find out that Cloud lied and took on the persona and identity of the actual first class soldier, Zack. Zack was also Aerith's first love and boyfriend, which explains her attachment to Cloud. We also find out that Nibelheim wasn't burned to the ground and that the people still live in it. Cloud lied because he never made it into that high rank and didn't want to disappoint Tifa. He was there back in Nibelheim, but not high ranked, but just as an ordinary soldier. Also, that execution scene was nuts back in Junon. Luckily, Tifa managed to escape with a neat minigame and got into a bitch fight with Scarlet. I'm glad this happened because up until this point, Tifa kept on getting slapped around by Scarlet and I kept screaming multiple times out loud, just slap her back. And let's just say my wish came true, albeit kind of hilarious. Scarlet may be hot, but she's one crazy ass woman. Finding out where the Shinra guys betrayed Heidegger and followed Sid was heartwarming to see. There was a point where the gang found Cloud washed up at mid -deal. We kind of find him brain dead and in a wheelchair. Great. Aerith was cute, don't get me wrong, but Tifa's wifey. That woman loved the hell out of Cloud. To be with him through all that and surviving a natural disaster together takes a lot. I forgot to say, but Cloud's vegetative state was also a result of Marco poisoning. Cloud's dream sequences with Tifa were among some of the most trippiest visuals in the entire game. Early in the game, we found out about Sid's dream of going to outer space crashing down. This explains part of his anger and his headstrong spirit. Next to Barret and Aerith, Sid is easily one of my favourite characters in this game. Further in part 3, it's find out that Hojo is Sephiroth's daddy and is even more mentally ill than before. That alone would have been good enough reasoning for Sephiroth to go mad. This man sacrificed his own son for science, fused him with an ancient evil being, and scarred him forever. Father my ass. I also like the magic pots in part 3 of the game, as they taught me to pay attention. The only way you can beat these guys is to give them an elixir, then you can damage them afterwards. If you don't, then they'll start to rub random bits and pieces from your inventory. The little bastards. However, once you manage to beat them, they provide you with an amazing XP and great loot. This is sad to say that I only found out how to use Phoenix Summon in the Northern Crater in part 3. <laughs> I didn't know that it had a restorative effect on reviving your allies if they so happened to faint in battle. This was because of all the times I had used it were when my allies were alive. Rookie mistake. Also, two times and four times cut are both OP as hell and Sid's high wind ultimate limit was a blessing. I like how the game let you choose two different parties for the last fight, even though I cheesed it by being level 99. That being said, there were moments in which I was still getting my behind whooped. That's because even more important than the levels are the equipment and the material that you have on. Sephiroth's theme in the last stage was amazing and some of the best music in the entire game. The design of him at that point was too sick. Sephiroth's one hit KOs were out of control and the Heartless Angel attack made me catch my breath. That being said, beating Sephiroth was worth all the BS he put my way. All in all, this game was phenomenal and deserves the title of it being a classic. If you haven't played it already, go do so. With all this experience, I'm now ready to embark into Rebirth when it comes out. By the time this video drops, it'll probably be way past the Rebirth release date. But that being said, it needs to be done. Thank you guys for watching, 
I tried to keep things slightly shorter than usual, but there were other parts in which I had to gush over the beauty of this game. Thank you guys for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video as much as I did making it. And thank you for the love on the channel, the videos, everything. Much appreciated. This is Black Sugar Eleven. Out.